not good at the announcements because I don't usually look at that screen. <laughs> so I forget to do them. But anyway, um, so uh, this week um, I began to, to think about you know, what the Lord wanted to say this morning. And uh, there, there are times when... Um, there are times when he kind of surprises me, and so uh, not, the, the topic didn't surprise me today, but um, when I began to study this topic um, of prevailing prayer, I was looking at the process and, and several scriptures, and I realized <clears throat> it really was almost as if the Lord gave me the title. This, the process for prevailing prayer is very persnickety. That's what I thought. Most people don't know what persnickety means. <laughs> I had to look it up. I've heard it before and I've used it, but I never knew what it meant when I used it, and so I probably used it wrong. But uh, persnickety, um, really, to, to simplify it, persnickety means um, there is a almost a laborious and a uh, a long process to get to something. And so as I began to read Luke chapter 18, we're going to read a, a few verses from Luke chapter 18, and I realized that the process of prevailing prayer is very persnickety. And uh, kind of like over the last few weeks, we were talking about fruit and bearing fruit. And um, last week, um, although I forgot my notes well, actually, I printed the wrong notes, and uh, so I didn't have my notes up here, and, uh, but I still got through most of it uh, pretty good just by using this thing and uh, thought maybe I should do that more often. So um, anyway, uh, but what we, what we found out is that, um, you know, when we're, when we're, when we're bearing fruit, um, it, it's, it's not just a process of plant a seed and wait. That it, bearing fruit takes discipline and, and all that stuff. Well, you know, your, our prayer life is no different than that. Our prayer life is kind of persnickety because there are some, some very real things that we have to be aware of when we're in this process of praying. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today, the persnickety process of prevailing prayer. And before we get to the scripture, I want to talk to you about one more thing real quick because it all will help us to understand uh, where we're going today and where we're going when we go into this persnickety process of prevailing prayer. And I didn't realize this weekend when JC began to speak at the conference and he got on the P words. And then I realized this morning, uh, so we, we were at this conference this weekend and uh, there was a prophet there, a friend of ours from Pennsylvania, and he began to uh, just really... Uh, talked to us and he, it just became this thing. It was all P words, uh, process, power, things like that. And it was really, really funny because he, he, he kind of made a joke out of it, but yet it was, uh, it was very good. And, uh, and then I realized the persnickety process of prevailing prayer. <laughs> I'm going to have to text him when I get, a, uh, get done here. But anyway, uh, so here's the thing. Anytime that we approach something, there's always a decision to be made. Anytime we approach something. So if you're going to a friend's house um, and you get in your car and you drive to your friend's neighborhood and you park in the driveway and then you come up to your friend's house, there's a decision to be made when you get to your friend's house. And that is, is am I going to cross the threshold and go in? Right? That depends on number one, depends on them being home, doesn't it? <laughs> Number two, it depends on them wanting you to come in. And then number three, it depends upon are we going to actually cross that threshold and go in? Or is something going to keep us from crossing that threshold and going in into the fellowship? And um, so um, we have to make a decision before we even enter this persnickety process. Are we going to come to the threshold and are we going to actually go in to the throne room? The whole point of praying is that we, we come before the Father and we lay bare all of our soul. 
And uh, we have to make a decision whether we're going to do that or not. We have to cross that threshold. And when we cross that threshold, we have to realize that when we cross that threshold, we've now come into his territory. And so now guess what? It's on his terms. It's no longer on our terms. And so we have to cross that threshold. And when we do, we come into his abode, his dwelling place. We have to come in there and we have to drop our agenda. We have to drop our desires, our flesh. And we have to realize that when we begin to pray, we're not going in with a list of things that we want him to do. We're crossing that threshold. We're going in, and we're going in to discern his will and then to pray and do his will. And so... Uh, really, really uh, quick, uh, Luke chapter 18, I'm going to read a parable to you. We're not going to really uh, uh, dissect the parable. There's one phrase in here that we're going to spend a lot of time on. And so Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 1. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant request. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust, unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Now there's a million ways, maybe a billion ways we could go with this parable, but I'm just going to tell you, we're going to focus on one little phrase right at the beginning. One day Jesus told the disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So I could, I could explain this whole parable, but guess what? I don't have to. Because Jesus said, here's the purpose of this parable. Always pray and never give up. So we're going to spend our time this morning talking about always praying and never giving up. So, always pray and never give up. If you haven't learned by now, I use a very repetitive style of teaching. <laughs> always pray and never give up. The important points, I say that so much that you get sick of hearing me say that. Uh, but always pray and never give up. Jesus said the point of this parable is always pray and never give up. Did you hear that? Always pray and never give up. So the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to define prayer. What is prayer? Is prayer a shopping list? I have these needs. Uh, I need this for my recipe to do life this way. And I've, I've got, uh, you know, Aunt Bessie's toe and, and these things. Is prayer a shopping list? It can be. Shopping lists aren't bad. When you have things that you... Uh, want to see God move in someone's life, those, those, those things aren't bad. But the shopping list can't be the point. Because the shopping list is our will. And if we're going to cross the threshold of this prayer thing, and we're going to come into God's territory, God's kingdom, we have to put on a kingdom mindset. And that kingdom mindset says, not my will, but thy will be done. You ever heard that phrase before? I think it was his son Jesus who said that. In a time when his flesh was screaming out, I don't want to go to the cross and die, but not my will, but thy will be done. Here's what prayer, in, 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 this, in this New Testament passage, that word prayer actually means to interact with God by exchanging our wishes 
for his wishes. Let me say that again. The definition of prayer is to interact with God by exchanging our wishes for his wishes. Now, I've heard people say, well, doesn't God give us the desires of our heart? Yes, the Bible says he gives us the desire of our heart. But here's the thing. The whole key to this book is that we become more like him than we are ourselves, which means his desires become our desires, which is the definition of prayer, where we exchange our wishes for his. So in other words, we might come in with a shopping list, and there's probably some really good things on the shopping list. I am not saying it's bad to pray for people's health or or situations at work or at home. It's not bad to pray for those things. But we have to pray for those things with a kingdom mindset, with a mindset that I want this situation to be resolved the way God's word says it should be. So I'm going to pray according to his word instead of according to my flesh or my desires. So if we are struggling to see our prayers answered, do you know what that might mean? It might mean that we're praying our wishes rather than his. Now, there are times when those things come into alignment, and that's good. That's really, really good. But there are times when I want something from God that isn't his will, and I'm just stubborn. <laughs> Let's just be transparent. Sometimes I want things that aren't the best for me just because I want them. I was raised in a family, and the family crest of the Harmon family is stubborn. I want what I want because I want it. And uh, my grandfather was that way for many, many years, uh, 62 or three years in his life before he met Jesus. Uh, it's amazing what uh, a heart attack will do <laughs> to, uh, yeah, your thinking process. So about 62 or 3, he had a heart attack, and he realized, hmm, I'm not going to live forever. Maybe I better get things right with the Lord. He'd been in church all of his life. And so I, I watched this guy at 62 get less and less stubborn and more and more in line with God's Word. I grew up with a dad. <clears throat> who, um, you know, when, when, when you want to honor someone, instead of calling them stubborn, you just call them tenacious. And so my dad was very tenacious. <laughs> he knew what he wanted, and he went after what he wanted. But uh, I watched my dad say, I, I don't want to be what my dad was his whole life. I, I, I want to I be uh, what God wants me to be. And so I watched my dad try to work uh, his way out of that stubbornness or tenaciousness and really be a willing vessel for God. And so uh, as I uh, grew up in that house, then I, I really just said, well, that's what I want to do. And so I'm going to take what my dad uh, modeled for me, and I'm going to take that to the next level. And so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna try to shave off all those things that you know, aren't healthy for me, and I, I want to go that next step. That's what he wanted for me, or wants for me, I should say. He's still around. And so um, that's the key. If we're struggling to see our prayers answered, we must first examine them to make sure they're His will. First John 5, verse 14 says, And we are confident that He hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him. It doesn't say we are confident that He hears us whenever we ask for anything. It says, whenever we ask for anything, that pleases him. See, so your question may be, well, how do we know God's will sometimes? That's called the Bible belt. You know, sometimes we've got to belt ourselves in the head with the Bible. You see... When, when you come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we don't have shopping lists. We do pray for people. 
we do pray for the sick and for the infirmed and the shut in. We do pray for that stuff. But do you know predominantly what happens in prayer meeting in that circle? We pray the word. We read the word and then we pray the word. Because we absolutely know that if we pray the will of God, he will do it. And so why would we bring our wishes and then hope they get answered rather than bring his wishes and know that they will get answered? told you it was persnickety. We have to have a general working knowledge of his word and be praying his word as we read it, as we quote it, as we declare it, as we pray it. This is how we pray God's will. We know his word. We know his desires. And then we pray those things into, into the earth, into our lives. Matthew 6, chapter 5, or excuse me, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. Now, uh, this is, this is uh, what, what people call the Lord's Prayer. By the way, uh, you do know that what we call the Lord's Prayer isn't the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Because if the Lord prayed, um, lead us not into temptation, that would mean that the Lord has sinned. And he never did. So he's not, this isn't the Lord's Prayer. This is the disciples' prayer. And the second thing we ought to understand is what we call the Lord's Prayer isn't a, a, a rote prayer that we're supposed to memorize and pray word for word. It's a lifestyle of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're not supposed to just say that. We're supposed to live that. We're supposed to live a lifestyle that brings honor and glory to God. And, and I don't have time to get into all of the inner workings of that prayer, but here's the deal. Prayer comes from the heart, not from the intellect. When you memorize something and you just pray it over and over, that's coming from the intellect. Our prayer is supposed to come from our heart. And I, I don't know about you, but the good thing about that is if you've accepted Jesus in your life, that's where he lives. So if we're gonna pray from our heart, we're praying from the place that's right, right next to him where we should know his will then, because he's living right inside that heart of ours. Don't let your mind mess up your heart and, and get, you, um, get you off base. Prayer comes from the heart and not from the intellect. See, it's relational and eternal before it's ever external. It's relational, meaning we're in relationship with Christ. We're in relationship with the Father. We're in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it's internal, meaning it has to affect us on the inside before it ever becomes external. Before we ever speak it, we have to know it and believe it. I, I told you, it's persnickety. Luke chapter 11 Um, again, is, uh, is another version of, um, of the disciples' prayer. And again, prayer is not a ritual of repeating memorized lines. It's a lifestyle of reliance upon God's truth, his word, which is truth. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus teaches us a principle that says we have to believe what we are asking for. That last line of Luke uh, 18, 1 through 8, but when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Your faith is crucial to your prayer life. You have to believe that what you're praying is his will, and it will happen. You can't just throw up Hail Mary prayers and expect your life to be in great shape. I remember as a kid, this, is, this really is on point, so bear with me. So when I was a kid, um, my parents got saved when I was five, so from the age of five until, uh, you know, for the rest of my life, my parents were churchgoers and 
I uh, was, I, you know, the gospel was presented to me. I understood it. Uh, we were taught from the Bible every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and twice a year we had a week-long revival, as if you could schedule that. But anyway, um, and so um, I remember I used to I used to toy with. I was like, well. I know I had given my heart to the Lord as a kid. I, I knew that. At about eight or nine, I really felt the call to teach the Word. But I struggled a little bit with what I wanted as opposed to what he wanted. And so I, I really struggled with, with some issues in my life. And I just remember saying, well, you know, I, I, I think it'll be okay if, if, uh, if something bad starts to happen. I'll just pray really quick and ask God into my heart and then you know, ask him to forgive my sins, and then boom, I'll be good. I'll be, I'll make it to heaven. And you know, that's that's not a faith-filled life. That's a flesh-filled life. And now I was really small, and uh, you know, I, I I didn't understand a lot of things. So, um, but I'm just telling you, there's a lot of 60-year-old people still believe in that. I got time, so I don't, I don't really need to be serious with the Lord and. That's not a faith-filled life. That's a flesh-filled life. And we can't live a flesh-filled life and then expect our prayers to be answered because Jesus said he's waiting to find people who have faith. And, and what he teaches us in Mark 11 is that we have to believe what we are praying. And the only way to truly believe something is to know for sure that it's the truth. So if we pray the word we are always going to be praying the truth and we're always going to be sure and believe what we're praying for. Faith is crucial and critical to the process of prayer. James 5.16 is a, is a familiar verse on prayer. And basically what it says is transparency is the key to our healing, both physical and spiritual. Transparency says confess your sins to one another. Transparency is the key. When we come into the throne room, I'm telling you, God knows everything about you. So if you come into the throne room and you think you're hiding something from him, uh, you're, you're being fooled. The enemy is speaking to you and you're believing lies. He knows it anyway. And the goal of transparency is not to reveal something God doesn't know. It's for you to realize he knows it all anyway. And so you just got to give up. You got to give up that. You got to give up the fig leaves. You got to give up trying to cover yourself and realize that God is our covering. And so you just got to be transparent. We got to confess our sins to one another so that we will be healed. Transparency is the key to our healing, both physical and spiritual. Matthew uh, 26, 41 is, is a principle Jesus teaches that prayer is the number one deterrent to temptation and sin in our lives. If you are crossing the threshold into the Holy of Holies, into his throne room, and you are coming to him, exchanging your wishes for his, that's the best deterrent for temptation and sin be in his presence, right? Because you see, when you're in the presence of God and you're tempted, guess what happens? If you're transparent, then guess who has to be transparent? The enemy. He becomes visible then. When he's trying to tempt you with something, if, if, you, if your mind is focused on the Lord and you are uh, you are just dedicated to him and you are praying in faith and you are believing and you're praying the truth of his word, I'm telling you, it's easy to see the enemy in his attacks. But if you're hidden and isolated and you're letting your flesh get the best of you, that's when, the, that's when you struggle to know whether it's good or evil. First Thessalonians 5.17 is another principle on prayer that says we must have a mindset of prayer. We have to be aware of the presence of God and then we have to be conversational in that. 
have to have a mindset of prayer. It says, always pray. Some versions say, um, pray always. If you're praying always, temptation is not going to have the ability to enter into your mind. Oh, the, the, there might be that fleeting temptation, but if you're praying always, that's the best deterrent to sin and temptation because you're focused on the Lord. You're not focused on yourself and flesh. Asaph, worship leader in, 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 in David's tabernacle and then in Solomon's temple, 40, over 40 years he was a worship leader. And when Solomon took over and then Solomon began to have some, some issues in his life, he began to marry foreign women and then he was letting their gods into his life and uh, just wasn't a good thing. And, and so as the leader goes, so goes the nation. And so as he uh, wasn't following the Lord, the people of Israel then began to uh, begin to be evil and do wicked things. Asaph in Psalm 73, <clears throat> one day he starts looking at the wickedness and the evil. And he starts to just ponder it in his mind. He doesn't even speak it. He's just pondering evil and wickedness in his mind. And he begins to speak on it. And he begins to moan a little bit inside in his spirit. He's like, evil people aren't judged. They're fat. Their eyes bulls out because they eat whatever they want. They have all the pleasures of life. And he's starting to just doubt this whole plan of God thing in his life. But it's just in his mind. He hasn't actually said it. And then at some point, he's talking about wickedness and evil. And he's like, God, what's going on here? And all of a sudden, he realizes that he's taken his eyes off of the Lord. When you begin to look at evil, when you begin to pay attention to that temptation, that tempting thought, when you begin to give it your attention, you've taken your eyes off of the Lord, and all of a sudden you're now vulnerable. You're vulnerable to whatever that temptation is. You're vulnerable to the evil and the wickedness that you're looking at. But you see, if we have this mindset of prayer where, where we, we know that we're in the presence of God at all times, and so we begin to just live that lifestyle of constant prayer, pray always, we begin to live that out, all of a sudden, the things of this earth that trouble us, all of a sudden, they have no power over us. Amen? We talked about James 16. James uh, James 5.16, now James 5.17. The prayer of a guy who's really, really trying hard availeth much. No, that's not what it says. It says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer of a righteous man prevails, some translations say. I thought that was my stomach. The prayer of a righteous man prevails. Our righteousness will put our prayers on the answer track. See? So we're back to Luke 18, 1. Always pray and never give up. See, there are times I've watched people when they're praying for something and they're like so intense, like, I just, I just know, I just know that God wants this to happen. So I'm praying this and I'm praying this. And, and all of a sudden you see them two days later and I know this is what God wants. I'm praying this and I'm believing for this. And then you see them three months later and the prayer hasn't been answered, but they're like, I know this is what God wants and I'm praying this and I'm believing this. And then you see them three years later and they're still saying, I know this is what God wants, and I'm, I'm praying it, and I'm believing it, and da, 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 but they're not seeing the prayer answered. What happens is they become what? They become discouraged. They become doubtful. We 
We have to come to this point where we do not let unanswered prayer affect us negatively. I'm going to tell you, most of the time when we think God is saying no, he's saying not yet. If it's his will. I've had a few no answers before, and they were actually God saying no. That's not my will. You're just stubborn or tenacious. But I have also had times when I've prayed and I'm like, God, I know you spoke this to me and I know this is your will. Why isn't it happening? And all I ever hear him say is, just wait. Just wait. Now, I have not always been the most patient guy. I have not always liked waiting in my life. But you know what's really interesting? If you talk to a few people that know me the best, they'll say to you, man, you are really, really patient. And I'm like, you think so? I I think I'm a little impatient. What I've realized is God has, has given me this ability to just sacredly wait upon him. And so I know for sure the direction of this church. I know it. I know God spoke these things to me. And we're sitting here two years after I started. And um, it doesn't look drastically different. But you know what's interesting? If you knew some of the things that are right on the edge of happening, and you'll know these in, in a month or so, a couple weeks maybe, if you knew what was just on the edge of happening here, you realize that God expects us to wait because it's not our timing that he's concerned about. It's his timing. He has a plan. And so we get all balled up and we get discouraged because we're like, God, you're not answering prayer. And instead of listening to him and instead of being patient, Because we're impatient, we're not listening, we don't hear him say, just not yet. We hear no because we don't get our way. When God is not saying no, sometimes he's just saying not yet. And we have to be patient. And the, the, the final point is this. The battle is over, and the victory has been won. Jesus died a cruel death on the cross. He was buried. He was placed in a tomb, and that tomb was sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers. But on the third day, he declared victory over death by rising from the dead. Prayer is the power to declare victory over the flesh, over the world, and over the devil. Sometimes you've got to wait three days. But guess what? It's going to happen. The battle is over. The enemy just doesn't know it yet. That's why he's working so hard. There are aspects where I really believe he probably does know. That's why he's working so hard to get us off track. But prayer is the power to declare victory over the flesh, the world, and the devil. Prayer is the power to give up what you want and to place all of your hope, all of your trust, and all of your faith in the truth of the word of God. And then just align yourself with the truth. If you were to see my prayer life, I'm not talking about over there on Wednesday nights. I'm talking about if you saw me during the day, you would be like, man, that guy didn't pray very much. You'd say, I don't, don't ever, I don't hear him very much verbally praying. It's because I, by faith, believe the word of God. And I know for a fact 
that this is true and that the end of the book we win and so I don't get caught up in the back and forth that a lot of people get caught up in I don't get caught up in the struggle between did this happen is this going to happen whatever I just know for a fact that if I am if I am if I am in my inside myself being relational with him and being internally aligned with his will I I don't have to do a lot of physical speaking in my prayer life I, my prayer life is mostly listening and the reason for that is he knows the end from the beginning <laughs> And so I just want you to understand that, that prayer is not this last-ditch effort to get your way. Prayer, our, our, our response to God, the proper, the, the proper process of prayer is that we come to the threshold and we drop our agenda and we say, God, what do you want? And then we begin to declare and decree that into this earth. Does this make sense? This is not your typical Sunday school lesson on, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That prayer scared the devil out of me when I was a kid because I thought, am I going to die while I'm sleeping? <laughs> and, and, you know, nothing wrong with that cute little prayer. I mean, you know, but... Uh, the, 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 the whole point is that our entire life with God is relational and conversational. And here's what I'm going to tell you. When I grew up and I left the house and realized that my dad knew a lot more than I thought he knew when I was living there, I would have listened to him more. And so I've taken that and I have taken that into my relationship with Father God, who knows everything and is truth. And I have come to this decision that I'm going to listen more than I speak in this relationship. And I'm telling you, there's times when he gives me direction and I just believe him and I don't even pray it. And it happens. It's because I believe it. And when we, when we, when we experience the truth, and we just begin to believe it, that is prayer. It's the faith to believe that what he says is going to happen. So I just, I just want to ask you to just close your eyes for a moment. And I know that, that we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. Some of us more traditional, some of us a little looser. But I, I, I just want to, I just want to pray and ask God to help us to drop our agendas, to drop our traditional thinking on this, and to realize that prayer is not so much what we say, but it's all about what we believe. And so I just pray that each of us can come to a better understanding of what it means to be relational with you, Father, to to be in conversation where we're listening to you more than we're speaking. There's times when we speak. We know that. But there's more times when we should just listen and just receive from you and just believe what it is we're receiving. So, Father, help us in this quest to become the people not only who are called by your name, but who believe you, believe your word, believe the truth, And then we stake our entire life upon that. In Jesus' name we pray.